Hello, ladies and gentlemen. How are we? Some people getting a little impatient in there. Uh, I've got a repeat there from uh, from the old uh, video. Um, how are we doing? So we are on a roll, it seems. Okay, so I'm uh, I'm the last to go today. So we're going to do some chemistry. Um, yes, have you all got your exambulances? Exambuli, is that the official kind of plural for exambulance? I don't know. Um, so uh, what are we doing today? Well, for year 12s, we are going to be finishing off some atomic structure and uh, maybe look at a couple of questions as well, hopefully if we've got time. And then in the next hour on a different live, year 13, we're going to be talking about um, rates of reaction and uh, deducing orders of reaction and the rate equation and uh, the Arrhenius equation as well. Maybe some rate determining steps if we get uh, if we get a chance to look at that. Um, but you know, 45 minutes isn't a long time. So of course we're basing this on action hours, 45 minutes focused um, in. And uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll make sure we get through everything that we can. Um, yeah, I saw it buffering. I, I genuinely, I, I don't know what the dealio is with that. Um, yeah, I just think maybe because literally every man and his dogs in the house at the moment watching YouTube and watching Netflix and stuff like that. Bandwidth is possibly a little bit of an issue, but uh, it's certainly not my end because I've got like, I don't know, I like think it's 400 meg broadband or something I've got here. So um so if it does buffer, guys, just I'm going to crack on regardless. Just keep refreshing it, and um, there we go. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's just demand. I literally think right now it's just demand on um, on bandwidth and stuff like that. So uh, we just have to be, if it does, it's only very, very temporary. So we just have to uh, kind of deal with that, okay? So... Year ones, we are going to do some um, some atomic structure. We did start yesterday talking about electrons in boxes, Holden's rule, how we create. Um, um, sorry, Ronnie, Rich, and I. Yeah, that's it, Ronnie. You're absolutely right. Um, it does seem to sort itself out. My, me watching, I'm watching myself right now and looking at your comments and stuff. So everything seems to be streaming just fine, guys. Okay. So we will get cracking because we do not have a lot of time. So uh, iPhone, iPad via cable. So um, this is what we talked about. This is what we're going to try and cover this week. Okay. We're going to be focusing on like inorganic chemistry. Um, there's a lot to get through. Okay. There's a lot to get through. Um, so also, yeah, someone told me to comment if I'm, the, if I'm an international student for LXL. Yeah, international students and exams and stuff like that. If you're not in the UK, you just have to check um, your kind of local government and find out what they're doing about exams. If exams can go ahead, then in your country, then they will go ahead. Um, but in the UK, literally, it doesn't matter where you're from, what exam board you're doing, you won't be doing an exam. Okay, so, um, so yeah, this is uh, the part that I'd really like to focus on today, if I can get my pen working. Um, so this bit here is what we're going to focus on today, electron configuration, mass spectroscopy, so on and so forth. So we did talk about electron configuration. I'm going to assume that everybody uh, kind of knows about electron configuration and how to write electron configurations. It's probably one of the first things you do in, um, in September of year 12. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about the ions, okay, and how we write electron configurations of ions, which is really, really important. Um, so let's just have a think. All right, I'll tell you what, let's have a look at a, um, let's have a go at a, well, let me just think, let me, let me just pick an element, ladies and gentlemen. So I got my periodic table here. Let's pick, uh, phosphorus. Okay. So, uh, P15. So P15 is the order of the day. Now, if they asked you, what the ion conf electron configuration of a P3 plus ion is. Now, the method for this, which I found the easiest, is to write the electron configuration of a phosphorus atom. Okay, so this could be for any element, and then make the necessary changes that we need to make. Okay, so absolutely, yeah. My my question is, what do we need to do? Do we need to add three electrons or take three away? So, Ruhab, you're absolutely right because it's got a positive charge we need to take three electrons away. So I'm gonna go 1s2, uh, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, um, 
So how many is that? One, two, three, four, five, so that's 10. So that'll be uh, 3P5, no, it won't be, that's, that's 12, uh, plus three, so it's 3P3, okay? So Benyon, you are absolutely right. So this is for phosphorus, but what we need to do is take three electrons away. Now it's kind of like last in, first out, okay? So what we need to do is look at the highest energy level electrons and take those away. So that would be it. That would just disappear. And we'd end up with this. Now this is your electron configuration of a P3 plus ion, all right? Now, just to kind of get, get you guys dialed in on this electronic structure scenario, okay? So that is um, uh, 3s2. Now, 3, 3 plus, that's kind of rubbish, really, because actually a phosphorus atom is 3 minus. So in actual fact, a phosphorus ion is 3 minus. So that'd be 3p3. So what would be the electron configuration of a p3 minus ion, ladies and gentlemen? Good, 3p6, okay? So what we need to do is take that away and we're adding three electrons, okay? Absolutely, we just add three electrons to it and we get our 3p6. Because of course, what electron configuration do all atoms take when they form their most common ion? So p3 minus is the most common ion. Um, if I just take a look at the periodic table, so that's p3 minus. Uh, this would be S2 minus, chlorine will be one minus. What have they all got in common? All of those ions, P3 minus, S2 minus, Cr minus. Good, absolutely, Rose, a noble gas. So all our elements, when they form stable ions, they tend to form um, the same electron configuration as their nearest noble gas here, which is argon, okay? Does anybody know the name of the term uh, oh, R, 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 R. Does it still apply to transition metals? Yes, it absolutely does. Okay. Um, uh, unless you look at one of their um, kind of, well, actually, no, it doesn't apply to transition metals because they have many stable oxidation states. Okay. So we're just looking at elements that aren't. And isoelectronic is the term. Okay. So, oops, I didn't want to move pages. I wanted to shift files. So this is isoelectronic with S2 minus. Cl minus and argon. Can anybody think of any others, if I just bring the periodic table back up, that are isoelectronic with our P3 minus ion? Any other ions that are isoelectronic with a P3 minus ion? If we just go back to our periodic table here and zoom in a little bit. What else have we got? No oxygen, no oxygen will form O2 minus, and that'll be isoelectronic with neon. Good. K plus is absolutely one because that loses an electron and ends up the same electron configure as argon. Any others? Ca2 plus, absolutely. Okay, so isoelectronic means has the same electron configuration. Same electron configuration. Okay, so um, SC3 plus as well actually could make it if there is such a thing as SC3 plus SI4 minus. Yeah, that's another good one. Very uncommon, that one, because it doesn't tend to form ions. Um, but yeah, so what we see is that if I just clear the decks here a little bit, so the ions of all of these, okay, and these, okay, depending on their charge and how many electrons they lose or gain, are all isoelectronic with each other but they all take the same electronic structure as argon. Now it's the same for neon here, okay? So magnesium two plus, Na two plus, F minus, O two minus, N three minus, they all have the same electron configuration as neon. They are all isoelectronic with each other, okay? So Hadia, yeah, absolutely right, okay? So the isoelectronic means they have the same electron configuration, okay? So bear that in mind when you're writing the um, um, uh, kind of electron configurations of ions, okay? They tend to form the uh, electron configuration of the nearest noble gas, okay? Which is really, really important. So do electrons first lose from the S orbital because it has lower energy level? No. They tend to lose higher energy level uh, electrons first, okay? So they always lose 
from the higher energy uh, level or higher energy um, orbital, or they lose uh, or they gain them into them. Okay, so it's always the highest one. Okay. How do you know when they jump to other orbitals? Uh, well, there's two exceptions we need to know about. We talked about those yesterday. That is uh, chromium and copper. Okay, chromium and copper. So, um, and actually, speaking of our transition metals, okay, so if we look at, um, let's take iron, 26, okay? So Fe at 26, so that is, uh, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, uh, so that's 6, that's 8, that's 20, uh, 3d6. Okay, so that is our electron configuration for a transition metal. Um, so I thought transition metals lose s electrons before 3d, yes. So that is an exception. Okay, so whenever you've got any element, other than a transition element, you just take electrons from the end one, the highest energy level, okay? But when you've got a transition metal, and it's what I'm getting into now, there's a different rule, okay? So for transition metals, okay, in, the, in terms of the 4S electrons, they are first in and they are first out as well, okay? So if we've got an Fe2 plus ion, okay, it will not be... 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d4. That is not it, okay? Because the 4s, uh, 4s electrons, 4s, 4s electrons are first in and first out. So what we actually get is 4s0, 3d6. So those two electrons that have left to form the Fe2 plus ion, um, then they get lost first, okay? So 4S are first in and first out when it comes to transition elements. You don't need to worry about that uh, exception for any other elements if they're not transition elements, but transition elements, you take the 4S electrons first. So Caitlin, very good question. Um, you can leave the 4S zero in there, absolutely, or you can just take it out completely and they'll still give you the mark. So either way, they'll still give you the mark for that. I mean, by writing 4S0, you're actually telling them that you really understand what's going on and there's no electrons in that anymore, okay? So what if you remove three electrons? Well, that's another good question and I was just coming to that. So let's say we had an Fe3 plus because we know transition elements can form multiple stable oxidation states, multiple stable ions. So what would we end up with? Just give me the 4S and 3D for this one. Good, yeah, 4S0, 3D5 would be for the Fe3+, okay? Now, when you've got chromium and copper, they're, exception that they're, they're exceptional when you're building their electronic structure. When you're forming ions for uh, copper and chromium, the same rule applies. They might only have one electron in that 4S orbital. That goes first and then take any others that you need to from the 3D. OK, so it's just exactly the same, exactly the same. So the reason um, uh, diet dead ass nothing um, that the 4S and 3D do tend to have this relationship is that they are so close to each other in terms of energy levels. OK, so you've got energy level one, energy level two, energy level three. Um, now, energy level four is up here. Let's say I'm overlapping here, but the 4S and let's say 3D is here, and that's that energy level there, the 4S sneaks in just underneath it. They're really, really, really close together. So electrons can hybridize, i.e. move between orbitals to help stabilize the structure of that, um, that atom, okay? So um, I, I got taught it was for every element too. Right, well, I mean every element that's got an electrons in their fourth energy level, okay? But the thing is, when you get to, it's not for every element, because when you get to these ones over here, okay, into the 4P, the 4P gets lost first. And then, you know, if you're actually, you know, here, you're actually gaining electrons anyway, okay? Uh, like gallium, gallium forms um, three plus. So it would lose, so gallium is 31. 
Let's change this. Come on, iPad. Don't do this to me today. Okay. So let's say we've got gallium. Let's get rid of all this rubbish. Save me writing it out again. So if we've got gallium, 31, so this would be 4S2, um, 3D10, 4P1. Okay, so that'll be gallium. So if we wanted to form a GA3+, plus, what gets lost? Well, that gets lost, and then those get lost, and you end up with that. Okay, so 3S2, 3P6, 3D10. Okay. Yeah, you don't remove anything from the D if there's anything in the 4S, okay? So if you've gone past or beyond the transition metals, like to gallium and beyond, um, well, you get to a point and you're adding electrons into the 4P orbital anyway, aren't you? And forming negative ions over there in the non-metals. But of course, gallium, GA3+, plus, you're going to lose 4P1, then you lose the 4S2, and then that's it. You're left with the 3D, Okay. So you have to know the first 36, Kuzal, okay? You need to know all the way up to and including uh, Krypton, okay? So that's the official in all three specifications or every specification for any A-level uh, exam board, you need to go up to Krypton, okay? So, um, so you remove electrons from D orbital first, but no. So you remove electrons from the 4S orbital first, from the transition metals, then take them from the 3D if you need to, okay? Uh, yes, you remove 4P before 4S, absolutely. 4P goes before 4S, because 4P is a higher energy level than 4S, okay? Sometimes they may be, all right? But if you've been looking at old spec questions, then maybe new spec questions, no, okay? Um, uh, from my experience, so has anybody got any general questions about electronic structure in general? Because um, otherwise we're going to move on to some mass spec now, if that's all right with you guys, because that's really, really important. Give me a quick nope if you haven't got a question or an N or a no or anything you like. All good. 4S0 because it's lost electrons from there. You don't have to leave it as 4S0. You can just you know get rid of it completely. Sweet. Right. Okay. So mass spectrometer, ladies and gentlemen, um, AQA peeps, where are my AQA peeps? Just write AQA in the chat if you are AQA and I'll just kind of get an idea as to how many of you are in here and if it's worth me going through the actual how uh, a mass spectrometer works. Okay. So quite a few of you. Thank you, Caitlin. I was after AQA only. Okay, now it's not gonna do you any harm, those of you doing OCR and NXL here. So I'm just gonna run through this really quickly, okay? And, I'll, and you'll understand why I'm gonna run through this really quickly. Um, so what we've got, this is a really basic mass spectrometer here, okay? So here, here, and here, okay? So our, our sample goes in to the end, and uh, that sample is vaporized, okay? Now there's two ways in which that can be ionized. We have to vaporize it first, okay? To make sure that we get all of those individual atoms or molecules separated from each other. That's really, really important. Here at this point, we ionize the sample. Now I'm using electron impact here. Now what electron impact does, if we've got X, okay? Then X gets turned into X plus, and an electron. The reason, because electrons are fired at the sample, knocking electrons off the sample, okay? And at A level, we assume that just one electron is lost, either from the atom or the molecule, okay? So it's a beam of electrons, yeah, absolutely, okay? So you can write it like this, or you can write it, including the electron that you hit it with, okay? And you end up with X plus and two electrons. So either of those are okay. So you can use either of those um, uh, either of those equations to represent the ionization of a sample. Now, why is the ionization of the sample important? Well, for two reasons. One, we need to accelerate it. So we got the acceleration of those ions moving forward. So I'm just going to show these as little pluses. Okay. So this is um, 
don't worry about state symbols. I think maybe that X gas, I think is probably, you know, it's like um, ionization energy really, isn't it? Okay, so using gases, I think that's important. Good question, Hadia. So these, okay, are negatively charged and they draw those positive ions through, okay, and fire those positive ions towards the end, okay? So we're, this is the time of flight mass spectrometer. So those are flying towards the detector on the other end, okay? I'm just gonna get rid of these. So they've all got a one plus charge, good R. So um, this gives them all the same kinetic energy, okay? So they've all got equal kinetic energy, really, really important. So the only difference between them is mass. Yes, Mag Megan, you uh, absolutely kind of preempted my question there. So they've all got the same charge. They've all got the same kinetic energy. So the only difference is the mass. Okay. So where you've got um, uh, the, the heavier ones are going to travel more slowly. Okay. The slightly lighter ones are going to travel a little bit quicker. The really light ones are going to travel very fast. So these are the heaviest ones and these are the lightest ones, okay? So the lightest ones get to detect the first. That's how we separate our sample by mass. So the lightest ones get to the detector first, then any others, and then the heaviest come last, okay? Um, if we're talking about deflection, uh, Shanketha, Shanketha, um, that's in a different type of mass spectrometry, okay? That's deflection mass spectrometry. If any WJEC people are watching, that's the one you need to learn, not the time of flight one, okay? Um, so kinetic energy, how can they all have the same kinetic energy but have different speeds? Well, it comes down to mass, okay? It's like if, I, if I've got um, a bowling ball and a ping pong ball and I poke them with the same force, which one's going to travel furthest? Well, it's the lightest one. OK, so just think of it that way. All right. It's a bit of a rubbish analogy, that, but it kind of works. All right. So you've got a bowling ball and a ping pong ball. You hit them both with the same amount of energy. The bowling ball is going to travel slower and the ping pong ball is going to travel faster. OK, so it's just the way uh, that is. Now, getting to the end, to the detector. And this is the same. Uh, this is another reason why it's important that they are ionized, because once they get here, what happens when they hit this detector, if we zoom in to our detector and our positive ions hit the detector, this has got a whole bunch of electrons going through it, in it, okay? Now, when those samples hit there, they gain the electron back again that they lost, okay? So they're actually being reduced when they get to the end, okay? It's like reduction, yeah? Reduction is gain of electrons. So... By virtue that that is happening, those positive ions gain an electron um, and that causes a current, okay? So a current, a, you know, a flow of electrons is instigated when those positive ions hit the, hit the detector. And Hadia, you're absolutely right. So the greater the abundance, so if you've got a load of positive ions hitting the detector at the same time, all the same mass, all traveled at the same speed, if they all hit our detector at the same time, you're going to get a really big current flowing through it. And that's how the mass spectrometer knows that you get a big peak. Whereas if you've only got like a few of them, there's going to be a smaller current and the mass spectrometer knows you're going to have a tiny peak. Okay. So, um, so I think that's pretty much it, right? Any question? Good. I'm glad this makes sense, Sanam. Give me a quick no if you haven't got any questions. Oxidation and ionization, um, very little to be fair phase. I mean, they, they do kind of overlap a little bit, but when something loses an electron, you can say that's oxidation. When something gains an electron, it's reduction. Uh, the deflection mass spectrometer, that's slightly different. It is, again, based on mass, but it, de it basically depends on where they hit the detector. Okay, it's where they hit the detector because the lightest ones are deflected most, the heavier ones are deflected less. So that's how they pick that up. Okay, that's how they pick that up. Uh, at Excel, no, at Excel, no CO, you don't need to know how it works, but you know what? It doesn't do you any harm to, you know, have an understanding of how it works then. Okay, 
So does fragmentation cause more abundant peaks then? Uh, not necessarily more abundant, but fragmentation does happen. Because when you pound these substances, let's say you've got molecules in there, when you hit them with electrons, it's kind of likely that it's going to hit a covalent bond and break a covalent bond. So that's how you end up with fragmentation, okay? Um, isn't there another way of ionization? Yes, there is. And I'm not going to go into that because not everyone's AQA. That is, a, that is um, electro spray ionization. And I've detailed that in the content guide. Don't worry, guys. I'm not going to go through everything. I'm just giving you an overall view. I got, I'm going to show you something where you can get all the information you need if you want to top up on it, okay? Um, ion drift considered a separate stage. Yeah, so this is like ion drift. This is the, the stage of ion drift. As they all start at the same time, but the faster ones kind of pull away and the slower ones fall behind. And that's what's known as ion drift. Okay. And that's, that's really bottom, really important. So Benyon, the bottom equation here is electron impact. So it's two equations you can use to describe what's going on at this stage here where the ions are formed. So you put your sample in as a gas, the electron hits it, you end up with X plus and the electron that's come off it. Another method of writing that equation, which is also perfectly acceptable, is including the electron that you hit it with, and then you get your X plus, and you get two electrons out because you've got the electron you hit it with and the one it's lost, okay? So that's it. Um, okay, so that's how the mass spectrometer works. What we need to look at now is, of course, what we're going to get out the other side. So at the bottom here, we have got MZ. What is MZ when it's at home? No problem, Benyon. Mass charge ratio, absolutely. Now let's not forget, this is literally mass to charge, uh, oops, say what you see, mass to charge ratio. In other words, it is mass divided by charge. Okay, so let's say we've got, um, Let's just do chlorine, shall we? Okay, so we're going to get peaks at, um, no, I'll tell you what, let's do, what have I got lined up over here? Um, silver, I got strontium, 85, 86, 87, and 88. So strontium, 85, 86, 87, and 88. I'm just making up those abundances there, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. So this is strontium 85, 86, 87, and 88. Now, yes, that's going to be 85, 86, 87, and 88. So yes, it's the mass charge ratio. You need to be really careful when um, um, actually stating this. It is the mass charge ratio. Now we can assume, and it is a big assumption, that the mass overcharge um, is, sorry, the MZ value equals the AR of that element, okay? Because why can we assume that? Why can we assume the MZ equals the AR or the, um, the mass of that particular isotope? How do we know that? Charge is always one. Absolutely, Anush. Okay, we're, we're going with electron impact here. Sorry to answer your question, R. Um, so we're going with electron impact. So we're assuming that the charge is uh, one plus. Okay, absolutely. Okay, all compared to one twelfth the mass of an atom of carbon. Absolutely. Okay, so this is strontium we're looking at here. Now, question. Now, be very careful before you type your answer. I would like to know what species causes that peak at 88. Type for me what species causes that peak at 88, please, ladies and gentlemen. SR plus, you wouldn't get a mark for that. Isotope to vague rehab. Come on, this is an exam question. What would you write if they asked you what caused that peak at 88? Nope, no one's given it me yet. We need to be specific, very specific. It's an isotope of 88. Raseb, boom, thank you very much. So if you were asked what causes that peak, you would have to write uh, 88 SR plus, okay? If you don't write the 88, no mark, because they're all strontium, yeah? No 88, no mark. No positive charge, no mark, okay? 
Now, this I've seen this question. It's not necessarily taught. It's been taken out of the spec, but it could very easily be just to test your understanding of mass to charge ratio. It could very easily be asked in an exam. If I had a peak here, just a tiny peak at 44, what possible isotope could cause that peak at 44? It's definitely positive because it's had an electron removed from it. Everything that comes out of a mass spectrometer has got a positive charge. So what's causing that peak at 44? No, can't really say that, Hadzia, because, you know, you're not going to get an isotope of strontium that's got, like, has lost 44 neutrons, if indeed it contains 44 neutrons. Good. It can't be a fragment because we're dealing with individual atoms. You can't fragment an atom. But yes, okay, uh, Niren or Niren, uh, Raseb's got it as well. Just, just so you know, if you get a cheeky little... Um, uh, peak further down, then it could be that this is an 88 SR 2 plus. Now, why would that cause a peak at 44? Well, let's not forget this is mass divided by charge. 88 divided by the charge that's 2 equals 44. Okay. Now, as I said, that is not in the spec. So if you haven't been taught that, it's okay. But if they really, really want to test your understanding of, do you know what mass to charge ratio means? And they give you something like this, you know, it's feasible, they could, okay? So does that, hopefully, it's by showing you that as well, it really helps you understand what is going on here and what causes these peaks. So is, was that helpful? Just give me a yes or a no. I'll be honest with me, that's fine, okay? Um, so yeah, so you've got this. And obviously right now we're just dealing with mass spec of elements and stuff like that. Brilliant, okay? Yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? Really, really tricky, okay? So it really helps you gain some understanding of what's going on in these mass spectra, okay? And like I said, the rules are, whenever they ask you um, a question, saying what species causes this peak, what species causes that peak, then you need to be really specific. Give them the isotopic mass, of that individual element, okay, of that individual isotope. That's the isotopic mass, okay? Not the AR, it's the isotopic mass. The AR needs to be calculated from this data because it's an average of all of them, isn't it? Okay, so all of these are isotopic masses. And don't forget, I mean, unless you're told otherwise, it's a one plus, okay? Everything we assume has a one plus. But in reality, if you go to work in, in quantitative chemistry, then you'll notice that you do get two plus peaks and stuff like that as well, okay? It has to be a positive ion to be detected, okay? Absolutely everything. So everything you know about whether um, non-metals get negative ions and metals get positive ions, that goes out the window because when everything, anything goes through a mass spectrometer, it gets a one plus charge. You could have a molecule of glucose, C6, H12, O6, uh, and it will come out C6, H12, O6 plus, OK, so it doesn't matter what you put in. It always comes out with a positive charge on every day of the week. Bet my house on it. Yeah, that's sort of that, 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 that thing. So when it comes to calculations, ladies and gentlemen, this is the general equation. So to calculate the AR, OK, the relative atomic mass, if we've got um, chlorine, OK, we've got chlorine 35. Oops and chlorine 37, for example, I know that um, this is 75% uh, and this is 25%, okay, in terms of their relative abundances, okay, in terms of percentage. So how would I calculate AR? Well, I take the isotopic mass of the first isotope, multiply it by the, the abundance, and then add the isotopic mass of the second one, multiplied by its abundance, all over a hundred, okay, all over a hundred. So yes, that actually comes out as 35.5. That's your AR for um, chlorine. The units are grams per mole, okay? Let's not forget that's really important, grams per mole. AR, MR, always grams per mole, molar mass, okay? Another tricky thing they could do is they could say that chlorine 35, it's a three to one ratio um chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 okay in which case if you're given just a ratio you can still use that 
even if you don't know percentages, because what you can do is 35 times three plus C, uh, not CL, 37 times one divided by what? What would you divide by in this case? Boom, divided by four, absolutely. So they can be a bit cheeky in an exam and not give you percentages, which is what we work in most of the time. The reason we divide by 100 here is because we're working with percentages. So whatever the overall abundance of all your isotopes put together is, then you divide by that, okay? So just be aware. Right, I'm gonna shut up for one minute. This is straight out of um, our content guide. So it's the question I've used in the content guide. I would like you please, ladies and gentlemen, to have a go of this first question. So we've got isotopes of strontium, Complete the table by deducing the missing percentage abundance and hence the identity of the missing isotope uh, for strontium. The AR of strontium is 87.71. Let's just zoom in on that. Okay. So can we see that? Okay, guys. So I'm going to give you three minutes to have a go at that top question. Is it 85? Yes, it is in the content guide, absolutely. Don't just give, be giving me guesses, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to calculate it. So I'm gonna give you another two and a half minutes. Jazz is done already. Shalane. Yes, yeah, 7.0, Ruhab. If you have finished this one, have a, have a crack at the second one as well. Okay, so, oh, interesting. There's a few people, fewer people watching than a few minutes ago. I was like, I wasn't there to do work. Um, <laughs> so, um, how would I do this? Now, me personally, I'd write it out like this. I always write it out like I'm going to calculate the AR, and I put the AR in there that's given to me in the question. Of course, this is the unknown that we want. So, the method I would use is to take this 100 over here, so that would actually be uh, 87.71 times 100, and that equals 8771. And then that equals uh, x times 0 0.5 plus, and then I'd just work out all of that, okay, and add it to it. And then from there, it's really easy to find x, okay? So, um, yeah, 83.6. If you've got 83.6, it has to be 84 and 0.5%. So that is what we're after there is 84. Okay. So 
Uh, that's it. Yeah, the 100 minus the total abundances equals 0.5. Yeah, so that's where that 0.5 came from. Because it's a percentage, you know that all of those need to add up to 100, don't you? So that's where you get that uh, missing. Um, yeah, see, and that's the that's the basis of all this question is that, okay, well, you know all the other percentage abundances. Whatever's left has to be that, right? You come across similar questions with empirical formula as well. Let's say they say, Oh, uh, um, uh, a molecule contains 60% carbon, um, 30% hydrogen, and the rest oxygen. You know, so you know that the other 10% is oxygen, okay? So this would probably be worth at least two marks, okay? Maybe three. Um, so, yeah, these are really, really common. AQA people, watch out, because they're making these more tricky, okay? If you look at the 2017 and 2018 papers, there's a couple of really, really tricky ones in there, okay? Uh, Sanan, 48.5 abundance and 109. Can anybody concur with me? So rather than me go through all the uh, calculations here, so 107.97. We've got 107 here at 51.5. Um, so what we'd end up with is 107.97 equals where well, we know that 107 is the first isotope times 51.5 and that'll be uh, plus uh, whatever the other isotope is times uh, 48.5 okay so doing all that working out then we end up with 109 okay which is the other isotope so you basically do the same there as you did up there, okay? So it's just a way of finding those um, unknown uh, isotopes, okay? So with these, like I say, there are some really, really good rehab. I'm really, really pleased. Um, so there is, I'm just gonna stop sharing a second. Uh, there is, um, there are some tougher questions in there. I just wanna show you something really, really quickly, okay? Let me just move this out of the way. I'm gonna share my desktop. Uh, which is this one. Okay, so you see my whole desktop here now. Um, so this is our plan. Okay, so in organic chemistry, this is where we're at now doing atomic structure. Um, let's zoom in quite a lot. Let's go crazy, 200%. So we're on atomic structure right now. We're going to look at some trends and stuff tomorrow. Um, now, if you want to learn a little bit more, uh, what we're doing is we're opening up sections of the content guide for you guys for nothing uh, so you can go and complete your studies, okay? Just yesterday, ah, oh, just yesterday, okay? So we talked a little bit about atomic structure yesterday um, and, uh, and we just finished that off today, okay? 2 p.m. for chemistry, year 12 every day, 3 p.m. for year 13 chemistry. So this is what you see. If you click on the content guide here, it will take you to the content guide, whether you got a subscription or not. But then what you will see is this, okay? So let me, I'll tell you what, let's just make this full, okay? So you get to see what's in the whole content guide, even if you haven't got a subscription. But what I've done is this, see where there's a padlock? For the next 24 hours, so up until just before two o'clock tomorrow, I have allowed you to see the um, atomic structure live class that I did. Okay, so you got access to the atomic structure live class. If it'll work, there it is. So you can see the live class I did with common questions, okay? Um, I've also opened up the um, a lot of videos in here, okay? So the atomic structure overview. So a lot of the videos in here are also unlocked, okay? So I'm gonna, in fact, what I'll do is I'll go in and make sure that you can see exactly which ones are unlocked. But basically, I'm gonna lock everything, but just the key ones that you need to know for your exam board, okay? Because if, if you want full access, then you're gonna to have to subscribe. So that's, um, uh, that's everything, okay? Um, Oh, no, Rose, absolutely not. Basically, I'm just giving, just for 24 hours, all I'm doing is just giving like three or four videos out of this. Just to, I, We're just trying to help people um, who are no longer in school. But of course, nobody gets any of the subscription benefits. Um, so of course, um, you know, if you're a subscriber, you get to see everything. You get to see everything at any time possible. You get to come to the live classes, which is starting again next week. You get to ask comments and questions and stuff like that. You get to access the exam guide. So there's like bazillions of stuff that you can do as a subscriber that you can't just by like dipping into this. Okay. No, no, it's all right, Rose. No worries. No worries. We don't want to lose you. Um, you know, so we, we don't want to kind of 
pee off our, our, our subscribers, okay? They're loyal to us. We work really hard for them and they work really hard for us, yourself included. Um, but what we're trying to do, obviously, is just help the, the thousands and thousands of students out there that haven't managed to finish their specification, okay? So when you cancel, if you do cancel, then you can cancel at any point during your subscription. You will still get the rest of that month. So you don't have to wait until like the day before your uh, subscription renews. You can just do it today. You'll still get access until the 27th, for example, uh, and it just will stop then. OK, um, so we're doing both, Raseb. OK, we're doing both. We're trying to help the masses uh, by going on YouTube as much as possible um, and, and just, you know, helping people out with some free live classes to finish the content because you know what it, it's just an awful awful situation that we're all in but our subscribers yes we are still doing free closed zoom sessions starting very soon again because of course what we were planning on doing for all our subscribers is like right it's time to revise exams around the corner and now it's like oh exams aren't around the corner what are we going to do so we're just kind of figuring that out at the moment um no idea when schools are going to open. Um, if you want coupons, please. Well, you're going to have to wait. Um, so uh, how much does a subscription cost? Um, so basically, head on over to our website, tailoredtutors.co.uk. All the pricing is in there. Um, I And you know what? I think it's massively cheaper than a private tutor. Um, it, it, we are properly exam board specific. There are other things out there as well on the, on the old interweb. Um, but, um, you know what? It's not as personalized, nowhere near. You're not going to find anything that's more personalized on our exam guide it is the most in-depth analysis of past paper questions, all organized into topics. Um, and you get to see what skills you use in there, the subtopics. Um, and yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, private tutors are like 50 quid an hour. All right. And, you know, that's that's probably not the cheapest out there, but it's probably on average, average 40 to 50, something like that. OK, um, so. Uh, so, yeah. So if you want to subscribe, guys, be our guest. The benefit of year 12, actually, I feel bad. I'm I, We're not doing this to kind of talk to people about subscriptions, but you're asking. So um, if you're year 12, you start a subscription now. OK. Um, when we get to the end of this roller coaster, maybe in June, and we've done an exam together and stuff like that, we're going to do some year content, year two content. We're going to give you the year two content for free if you sign up for an AS. Uh, but if you keep your subscription through the summer and into year two, you keep the year one price, which is cheaper than the year two price. Year two, obviously, you get everything. Year one, you get half of it, okay, which is the AS stuff. Um, so if you sign up as a year one now, learning all the AS stuff, we will give you the year two stuff um, just as we finish the exams. And then if you continue that subscription right through year two, you get to keep the year one pricing and you'll get everything for year two that you need. OK, so that's something we've always done here at TT to, to reward our uh, year one subscribers for sticking with us. You get to keep the cheaper option right the way through into year two and you save a bucket load by doing that. OK, and you get to access us all the time. So um, so, yeah, that's it. Uh, will we do exam technique on YouTube too? Um, no, I think um, we're going to do some study sessions, study with me sessions when we get to the exam technique section of our plan, our phase two, if you like. We're going to do study with me so we can help you do those papers and stuff, okay? Um, so yeah, Rose, absolutely. Yeah, you keep that from January right through into year two. That absolutely applies to you. It's not a special offer for right now. It's something we've always, always done. So anybody that's subscribed, let's say for argument's sake, middle of june anybody year one that's still a, subscri a subscriber uh will turn on the year two content for you you'll get access to all the year two contents so you can get ahead of the game and you keep your year one pricing right through into year two so long as you don't stop your subscription okay so the study with me rasseb is basically just a place to go uh, ronnie's doing it every day and it's basically you can just do any study you want but it's just an action hour working with ronnie she'll be working on our comments and stuff so uh, that's all that's uh, that's all it, that is okay so um thank you very much for coming along today guys uh tomorrow we're looking at periodic trends we have got a lot to get through tomorrow okay we need to look at group two group seven uh we need to look at ionization energies and all the different trends in the periodic table okay um, just want to say thanks for these streams, helping me out during these conflicted times. 
Brilliant. Yeah, that is an absolute pleasure. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad there are students out there like yourself who appreciate what we're trying to do. Please spread the word, guys. OK, not because we want people to subscribe, but because we want to help people finish their spec and get especially year 12s, make sure you get ready for next year. OK, so thank you very much, guys. And I will see you tomorrow at two o'clock.